Hi everybody, I'm Zilla Blitz and welcome. Today we're going to review Point Blank V is for Victory, the tactical card-based World War II combat game from Lock and Load Publishing and designed by Sean Drulinger. Let's start with our one minute power review. Big picture, this is one of my favorite games of 2022, but I had to earn it. It was also one of the more challenging games that I learned this year. Now, why did I like it? Combat is gritty, it is tactical, it's Bond's narrative, and the, I always feel like as the player, you have tons of interesting decisions to make, and the card system works really well because you never really feel trapped. You might not have ideal cards, but it always felt like I had something to do. So I love the decisions, the narrative, the agency, the somewhat randomness of it all, the dynamic nature of the terrain. It's a fascinating, energetic system to capture tactical combat in a way I've not seen done before. Second thing, this game is massive. I mean, this is a desert island game. It might very well be the deepest war game package I've seen in terms of your ability to play new scenarios and create new things going forward. There's a design your own system for scenarios, but you literally can throw any, everything together. There are over 500 units, 200 like terrain cards and you've got your action deck in there too. And it's so easy, it's a literal World War II sandbox to be able to go in and just create scenarios that you wanna try out. Lastly, and I know this is an important consideration for a lot of people, this is just as solid of a two player experience as it is a solo experience. I've played it two player now, I've played it solo playing both sides, and I'm currently playing solo against the bot. All three systems work. So if you're looking for a good solo game, this is it. If you're looking for a good two player experience, I think you'd find that either way, the system really works well. I also wanna mention that this is one of the more challenging games that I've learned this year. And there's a couple of reasons for it. Reason number one, although each individual mechanic isn't complex, the nature of the tactical combat that you're playing out means that all these mechanics connect and interweave. And so sometimes that interweaving and interlocking of the mechanics makes for some complex situations. The second part of this is, this is a brand new system and it's got a hefty rule book. And as good and as much effort I think has been put into that rule book, I th still think it could use some further refinement to help facilitate and make the learning process a little bit more fluid. Lastly, I've heard a lot of people talk about the terrain system and I wanna mention that in the short review. I really like the terrain system even though I was skeptical at the beginning and yet I do have kind of a semi caveat to that liking and I'll talk more about that in the in-depth review. So now let's talk at a little bit more relaxed pace and to greater depth at some of the comments in the shorter review. First up, I wanna start with the gameplay because I think that's where this game really becomes magical for me and where it really resonated with me as I've been playing through it over the past month or so. So uh, when I think of games, they're, they're kind of, I think, three holy grails, if you would, that I kind of imagine in my eye as I'm playing a game. The first one is, does the game give you interesting decisions? And this game, I feel like at every point of the way you're playing it, it gives you interesting decisions. You never feel hopeless. You might feel trapped, but you always generally have something you can try to do. I think that's partly in the way the terrain system unfolds and it's kind of dynamic shifting nature. And I'll talk more about the terrain system later, but I think that terrain system is, is a way that kind of creates that. The, the choices and the action cards and the abilities of the units and the way the combat flows and the, the leader's influence, the system just lends itself to interesting decisions. And the cards, you never really feel like you're trapped. You might be looking for a card and you're like, I wish I had this, but there's always some way to move forward and to kind of keep things going and give you an interesting action to take. So from a decision perspective, uh, and I think that's where I was really surprised with this, I felt like it's a very free flowing, uh, it rewards creative decision making. You got a lot of different things you can try and it's just fun to make these decisions. So it presents interesting decisions at all times and it's fun to do these decisions. The second kind of holy grail that I look at in terms of uh, whether a game is gonna resonate with me is does the combat and does the game feel connected to reality? You know, is it, is it too gamey? Is it, is it, does it feel like it just doesn't work? Right? It's like, well, this doesn't feel like it represents what really happened. And I think this game, I, I can see these engage, engagements kind of unfolding in your mind's eye. And it's like, oh, that's cool. Oh, wow, that's cool. So I feel like this game connects well to that gritty, tactical, 
small arms, individuals trying to make cool decisions, leaders type of level of combat, and you, you really get a sense that this action is unfolding in a really engaging way. So it connects that box too. The last thing is, and this is what I think another element that surprised me about the game the more that I play with it, is that it does the game spawn narrative. I love games that tell stories. They had games that when you finish it, you're like, wow, that was cool. Now these are small units, individual leaders and squads and individual vehicles and stuff like that. You're gonna have heroes. You're gonna have squads that completely misperform. You're gonna have squads that fall into streams and get stuck or get trapped by wire. The stories of the individuals and the leaders and the failures and the successes as one of these small engagements play out is really cool. And the thing that strikes me with it too, you can take a very small scenario. And if you watched kind of the playthrough that we did, the three episode playthrough that I did with the game, you know, that's like, we had 10 cards out of a 500 card system. And the story that that simple, simple scenario created is just cool. I mean, they're not, you're not writing like War and Peace, right? It's just a small tactical engagement, but it unfolds in this way that when you get to the end of the game, you can tell the story of that engagement and there are just lots of really cool places where you're like, oh wow, they could have done this, but they didn't, or wow, they screwed up here, or wow, that was really heroic and that saved the day. And it just unfolds this way, so you're left with this narrative at the end of the game that you're like, wow, that was really cool. So on all three of those elements, the grittiness, that realistic nature of combat, the narrative that the game spawns, and the interesting decisions that the gameplay presents you, Everything, every one of those, it just hits the, the nail right on the head. It's just, it's, it, it's been really fun. I think this is a game I'm going to come back to over and over, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the depth part of it next up too, because, but I feel like the gameplay, there's a magical element to the gameplay once you get up to speed with it, and I'll talk about that in a moment, where all of a sudden it just starts to flow and you're like, oh, this is pretty cool. So anyway, there's that. I wanna to talk to greater depth about the depth of the game because I don't think you're buying a game when you're buying this game. This truly is, I, I mean, I, I, I can't think of another game that has greater depth and replayability than this system. You're not buying a game, you're buying a system. They could have put half the stuff in this box and had a completely full game. Again, I mentioned in the earlier part of the review, but you have over 500 unit cards and they can be tanks, vehicles, trucks, uh, anti-tank guns, anti-tank squads, squads of all different levels, leaders, satchel charges, flamethrowers, machine guns, brands, piats. You've got so much stuff to create scenarios with. And the game, so there's a whole book of scenarios, which is, I think there's probably like 20, but there's also a design your own system where each unit has a point value. So you could get together with someone, you could say, okay, let's take 150 points and we're each gonna pick 150 points worth of units and leaders and equipment and stuff like that. And then we're gonna throw down a bridge in the middle of the, the map here, and we're gonna just go at it just so you can take the bridge. And, it, and you can literally design these things in five minutes. Again, going back to that, situation where I showed that three uh, episode playthrough of the Canadians trying to take a farmhouse behind Juno Beach and stuff like that. That literally took five minutes to think up and just to toss down. You're like, sure, let's do it this way. And the first time I did it with US Airborne, I'm like, okay, let's try Canadians this time. I, there are hundreds and hundreds of different ways that you can create scenarios with this. And I will also say the thing that, that magnifies and multiplies that replayability is that the same scenario, depending upon how the terrain unfolds, is gonna play completely differently the first time you play it and the second time you play it. So if you, know, you could play each of these scenarios in the book, you're probably gonna play it five or six times before you start to see something that kind of played out the way one of the other ones did. Because of that dynamic terrain system, and I wanna talk more about that as we go a little bit further on there, because I think that's important to talk a little bit about how that works and, and my impressions of it is starting out and things like this. We'll get to that in a little bit. But that terrain system means that the same scenario is gonna play out completely differently depending on you. Because there's a lot of ambiguity and kind of fog of war that's kind of spawned by the way the terrain system works. And you really don't know how the thing's gonna play out until you get into the system. So yeah, depth, replayability, you've got so much terrain to work with. If you are someone who likes to create scenarios or is perfectly comfortable just kind of like throwing some stuff out there and seeing how it plays out, and you can just create a story in your mind's eye, in literally five minutes you can be playing that story. It's so easy 
to design your own scenarios, to put things together and try them and stuff like that and just play out stuff. And you don't need, the other thing I will say is, um, and it's probably worth mentioning this here too, you know, smaller scenarios are still fun. And again, going back to referencing that one that we did the three episode playthrough on, you know, that used 10 cards out of 500 that are available, more than 500 that are available in the game. And that just that small, tiny subset created a really interesting 30 minute scenario that you can play out. So depending upon how much time you have, I, and I think the system, you know, the, the way the mat works and the way the mat works and the way that scope and scale works, you know, super large tactical situations just aren't gonna work. This isn't designed for that. But the kind of the one we did at the, in the playthrough, times three or times four is probably kind of the limit of the scope and the scale of where it's really gonna feel kind of flowing and things like that. But within those, those boundaries, if you would, it's just so much you can do with it to create really interesting kind of scenarios to play out. So yeah, desert, total desert island game. If I were going on a desert island, so you can take 10 games with you, this is definitely going in the boat to the desert island because you can play this, there's like hundreds of hours of gaming in here. There's so much in here. I wanna talk a little bit about the dual nature of the game because I know there's people that are interested in the solitaire experience and people that are interested in two player and some people that are interested in both. Um, I've played this two player, it's awesome. It's really good and it's designed originally, it's, it's a two player game, right? But everything's there, the grittiness, the decisions, the narrative, they're all there. It's super fun to play two player. Then now talking a little bit about Solitaire, there's an AI bot that's developed and layered on top of the two player experience to be able to play as another player in the Solitaire game. So it's not a procedural thing in terms of that you literally get a flowchart AI system that is going to handle the decision making for both sides, either an offensive side or a defensive side or a neutral side if both sides are offensive and things like that. You could say, think of it that way. But the AI bot is designed to play against you. Um, I'm playing that now and I'm playing against the AI in a defensive posture and I really like what I'm seeing so far. I feel like in order to kind of render full judgment on the AI bot, I probably need to play maybe two, three, four more times really to kind of say, okay, how does this all unfold? And for the sake of producing this redo in a kind of a timely manner, I wanted to kind of make sure I get it out now. But from what I've seen of the AI bot in a defensive posture, I like the decisions it's making. I think you can have a good, solid, solitaire experience playing against the AI bot. And it should also be said too that you know, playing both sides is really fun with this system too. You're not really missing much, you're just missing a little bit of deception with a card deck, and you're missing a little bit of deception with kind of those action cards, what might be hidden in the other person's deck of action cards. But it's a really enjoyable two-player solo experience playing both sides. But the shininess of that AI bot system is really encouraging so far, I really like it. I will also say, however, um, like many of the systems and like this game as a whole, there's a learning curve to the AI bot. You've got some flow charts, it's got some complexity. It's gonna take you a while to get up to speed with it. I would recommend learning the game two player first. If you're playing solitaire, you wanna play both sides for a while. And then once you start to get comfortable with that, then layer the solo bot system on top of that because I think it, that's gonna make the learning experience more enjoyable. But yeah, so far so good, really good and really solid on all of those experiences. I think I feel comfortable recommending the game as a solitaire experience and I feel comfortable recommending the game as a two player experience. I wanna spend some time and talk about the complexity of the learning experience because I mentioned in the, in the power review, this was one of the more challenging games I've learned uh, since coming back to wargaming. Flat out, I'm just gonna say that, this has a learning curve to it. Now, it's not at the lock and load tactical system level of complexity or an ASL level of complexity, but it is up there. It, there there's a lot to it. And, and let me kind of explain a little bit about why I think that is. Um, there's a lot of mechanics in the game. There's a lot of little mini systems and the mechanics. There's lots of different types of units and lots of things can happen to those units. Um, and so what you're often faced with is situations where all of these systems have to work together. So for example, there's leaders in the game and there's units in the game and there's vehicles in the game. And then there's shaken status in the game and there's spent status in the game, right? So right away you can see that for all of these, you have to be able to understand a units, if a unit is shaken and how does that apply to leaders? How does that apply to units? How does that apply to vehicles? If a unit is spent, 
How does that apply to this? If a unit is spent and shaken, how does that apply to this? And then you might have something, for example, like you've got a melee situation. Now, how does a situation in melee work where some of the units are spent, some of the units are shaken, and you've got a leader in there, right? So you can start to get this idea of and then there's support weapons, how to support weapons weave in this. So it's this, it's this soup, if you would, of systems. And very quickly, as you start to play the game, you realize that all these systems mesh together and you really need to know and be able to execute the rule set in a fluid manner at, with all of these things integrating. So what that means is, as I was learning the game, the first couple scenarios that I played trying to learn the game and things like that, it, it took a while. There's a lot of rule diving. Cause like, okay, I know how melee works for units. How, do melee, how does melee work for leaders? And how does it, what happens if a leader is shaken in melee? And wait a second, this is control, but does a support weapon control an objective if it's broken or out of ammo, does that count? And so, so you, you get, you find as you play, you're just gonna have lots and lots of questions because of the integration of the system and you're gonna be spending a lot of time looking in the rule book. So for that reason, totally honest, this is not a game you're gonna pick up and be playing in an hour. This is a game that's going to take a number of play sessions before you feel like you're going to be kind of fluent at the game. The analogy that I would use with it, okay, and, it, and it's, it's overstating it, but I'll, I'm gonna say it anyway. It reminds me a little bit of learning a, a foreign language. So I've learned a few languages over the course of my life. And when you're learning a language, not that this is as hard as learning a language, right? Learning a language takes a year, takes six months, takes a couple years. That's a huge thing. This is not that hard, okay? So calm down. But the analogy holds, right? Because when you're learning a language, when you're first learning it, you're like, oh, what's this word? Oh, I forgot this word. I don't know this word. Wait a second, how does this system work? How do I say this type of thing in this language? How do, and you're constantly like going into books and dictionaries and asking friends and trying to figure out stuff and you feel like you can't say the simplest sentence right and then at a certain point you realize you're having a conversation you know you kind of work through that period of time and you have a conversation and it's flowing and you realize you don't need the dictionaries you don't have to ask friends how to say things you don't need to check the rule book for systems or the grammar for systems and things like that and all of a sudden you can go for like 15 20 minutes and it's like whoa this is so cool and that's what learning this game felt like for me. I felt like there was just, a, you know, I'm not, it's hard to put an hours on it, but I'm gonna say four, five, maybe, you know, over a number of sessions where I felt like it was really sluggish. I just was having a hard time getting airborne, getting fluid at executing the system. And I feel like I'm still learning it. There's things I haven't added in. There's things I wanna build into the system. I'm still kind of learning it. So to kind of back up, was it enjoyable to do that? Yes, to a degree. I, I'll mention one more thing where there are a couple times where it was like, wow, this is, this is harder than I had hoped. But it's an enjoyable system to learn. There's a lot of cool stuff and you're kind of making progress. But it is, there is, you have to make a commitment to it and the commitment will reward you. It's probably the best way to put it. Now, the second thing that I do want to mention, because I feel like it's important to say this, um, is talking about the documentation and the rule books. Now, this is, I think it's a delicate thing to say because there's a lot of little angles and pieces that are attached to this. The, the rule book is massive. It's, uh, what is it, 80 pages or something like that? Hang on one second here. Uh, 95 pages. Now the text is really big and there's graphics and stuff like that. So it's, it's not really a 95 page rule book and there's kind of synopsis at the end that kind of pull together the important parts of each little different system and things like that. So this is, I think what's fair to say, this is a rule book that the developer and the designers put their heart into. They have, they have not, for lack of effort, put forward a rule system that is in any way mailing it in or not trying to do an amazing job at helping people to learn this game. It's very apparent at every level of this game that this has been a labor of love and there has been tremendous energy and effort and integrity put into building this rule set and put into building this system. Absolutely 100% evidence. So I think that's very important to say that because of what I'm gonna say next. Having said that, I feel like the system and the integration of all the different mechanics are, so, there's so much going on that I feel like the documentation needs a, a, 
a kind of more iteration. It needs a little clarity. It needs a little bit of kind of cohesion in terms of making the learning experience a little bit more fluid. Now, I will also say the developer and the designer have the designer has been incredibly helpful. And if you look on Board Game Geek, that's one of the things I look for is is the designer in there answering questions? That's a hard place for a designer to be because people can get frustrated and all those kinds of things. But is the designer in there ans answering questions? And I can say the designer has been in there and every single question I've seen, there's been answers for that. And there's work on kind of fleshing out some of the little bit of ambiguities in the rules. There's been a ton of work done post-development on this system. And I feel like over time, because I know the sales have been really good for this. And I also think, this is a system that's built for expansions, right? I mean, I'm just, oh, Pacific Theater with this system would be amazing, it'd be so cool. Thinking North Africa, the terrain in North, oh. I mean, there's just so much you can do with this system and I hope it grows over time. And I get a sense, the reason I mention is that I get a sense that the designer and the developer I mean, I'm not speaking for them, but I get a sense that they are really want to make this system good and with the potential idea to build off of it in the future. So it's by no means do you feel like the rules are what you get, good luck, because there's been a lot of help and a lot of effort put into helping people learn that. But to go back to that point, there are places in the rules, and, and I think part of it comes because all of the systems have to work together. So for example, um, you know, if you're looking at a situation where how does a leader behave, a shaken leader behave in melee combat? Well, it, you know, you look in the rules under leaders and maybe it's not there. You look in the rules under shaken and maybe it's not there. You look under the, the rules of melee and that's where you find the part of leader, but it might not be, right? It could be someplace else. So as I was learning the game, there's a number of times where I looked in a particular system. It's like, I couldn't find the answer there. I looked in another system, well, maybe it's here and I couldn't find it there. And then I looked in a third place and then I found it. It's like, okay, here it is. So th there is an element I think that because the system is, is, is complex, that there will be further evolutions and refinements in the rules. I don't think that's a reason to not get it because I think almost all of the questions you have at this point in time, you can look on Board Game Geek and get your answers to. There's just a ton of information that's put there. And I know there's clarifications and an errata kind of being worked on to kind of clarify some of the ambiguities and to kind of refine a little bit of the systems. But I think to go back to that main point, for a system that is so complex, in a system that's got so much doing it, that really captures so many elements and aspects of tactical World War II combat. This has been a marvelous job at a first iteration of a core rule set. And I feel like over time, it's only gonna get better. So I don't think it's a reason to not play, but you do wanna be ready for that, that there's gonna be times where you're gonna be looking for something and you might not be able to find it in the rules. I wanna talk about the terrain system because I think there's a lot to say about it and I'll try to be concise, but it's definitely very interesting, it's very unique. Now, when I was first learning the game and I started reading about the terrain system, I thought it was the dumbest thing I'd ever heard about because basically you can have a unit in a sector and then it moves within the sector and it changes the terrain. And I had this, I was talking to one person and I said, it's like kind of like Corporal Dumbledore, like spawns a forest. It's like, what is this? And then it was kind of explained to me how it works. And the idea basically is that one sector doesn't contain one type of terrain. It contains a number of types of terrain and the units are moving through it with kind of a less than perfect knowledge of what lies around there. So you're gonna have these situations where you're gonna shift from, say, for example, this woody section, you're gonna run down a road and end up in this kind of farmhouse or something like that. So the, each sector contains a multitude of, if you would, maybe hexes or terrain elements. And the, the game plays out kind of as units kind of move through these. So what you end up with is this kind of shifting dynamic terrain that the game plays with. And I'm like, okay, that, that makes sense. I get it, that's okay. But I think what really matters with this is kind of how it plays. And so I, even after kind of hearing that explanation, I was still pretty skeptical. I'm like, yeah, it still feels a little bit weird to me, right? And then I played. And once I played, I'm like, no, this is totally cool. And why is it, why would, well, okay, I like it. I don't, I, I, I don't wanna speak for anybody else, but I really liked it. I liked it for a number of reasons. One is because it creates this kind of ambiguity and uncertainty and fog of war, so that every time you play that scenario, it's gonna play out a little bit different. It creates narrative. You get this sense of, okay, this squad's moving down, and like, damn it, they can't find any good terrain, and they find all of a sudden, and now they end up in this wire, and they gotta figure out how to get around it, 
or they find this perfect place, they find like a good, nice cover, a stone wall to take cover behind. They can drop some smoke. You've got streams. You've got good things can happen, bad things can happen. It helps enhance that sense of narrative and it helps the interesting decision matrix of the game. So it really kind of makes those two aspects, again, of those three checkboxes, those kind of dynamic nature and decisions of it and the narrative, it just brings those to life in a way that I've not seen happen in another game. So all of my skepticism went away with that, except for one element that I will say. Now, the, the other kind of, I mentioned one of those other kind of those three things that I look for in a game is, does it feel real, right? So when you're playing the game, does what happened feel like, yeah, that, that, that kind of represents combat. Now, I'm gonna say that 90, 80 to 90% of the time, the way the ter terrain mechanic works, it feels like, okay, I can get that. You know, this unit kind of shifted in here and that kind of gave some information to a unit behind it so they could shift out. Because sometimes what'll happen, right, is you'll have unit A can't see unit B. Unit C that's in the middle of them will move, find some different terrain, and now unit A can't see unit B, right? And, and that's the situation. It's that one particular situation that sometimes I kind of find hard to match up to the reality of what probably could have happened. Now you can kind of explain it, right? You could say, well, okay, maybe this unit shifted to a woods and they're able to radio back and say, okay, if you shift to the left, you're gonna be able to kind of move and get out of range between this other unit. So there's kind of ways you can explain it, but I'd say there's maybe like 10 to 20% of the situations where like, I kind of have to stretch a little bit to accept how that terrain mechanic just worked. Now, the most important thing is though, I don't care, <laughs> okay? I just don't care. Why? Because the way the terrain mechanic work enhances the narrative element and it enhances the decision making to such a great degree that I'm willing to sacrifice that element of Re reality, if you would, that kind of have a little bit of gaminess in there because it's so good at these two other aspects. So would it be perfect if all three of those elements worked with the terrain system that I felt like it was, it represented reality all of the time, that it created cool nugget narrative and it created cool decisions? Yeah, that's ideal, right? But I really like the terrain system and I just kind of look the other way when I get one of those situations like, yeah, I'm not sure how I would explain that in my head, right? So hopefully that all makes sense. My bottom line is that I, I didn't think I was gonna like the train system, but I love it. I really, really like it with the caveat that there are some times where it's like, okay, I'm just gonna kind of look the other way, that thing happened and we're just gonna play on because I like the way it works. The, the bottom line is that I think it really works well within the game. As a game playing experience, it's really cool. Just a few things before we wrap up. Um, the art style, I haven't mentioned it yet, and I probably should have early on, but it enhances the experience. I love the grittiness of the cards. I love the way the terrain looks. I like the counters and the markers that you're dropping down, the units, the vehicles. The, the art style, I think, really just pulls you into World War II tactical combat. So kudos on the art style and everything that's here. It's just, it's visually, it's a real treat to look at. Um, but one more thing I wanna mention, because I've seen it mentioned in a number of places about people talking about the game, is the line of sight rules in the game. I feel like they're fine. I actually don't feel like they're hard at all. Um, and I feel like they just, they work really well. Now, there are situations where you're gonna have units on the same side of the map where it kind of forms an L, but I think you, you kind of have to accept that, again, you, these aren't absolute distances between these units and when you're playing the game and stuff like that. So what you're looking for there is a consistent system that can be applied. And for me, again, that's one of the things like, yeah, I'm, I'm fine with it because it's easy to apply, it's consistent, and it works really well in terms of how it handles the gameplay. Last thing I want to mention as we get through is that is kind of the time mechanic in the game and some just some thoughts on that. So uh, there's 108 action cards, I think 108 roughly, in the deck that are in the deck when you're in play. And uh, the way time works is that, that most scenarios are going to be like two turns, three turns, or four, turn, and four turns, and each turn is a pass through this whole deck. Um, and it's probably about 30 to 45 minutes to play through a deck as you're playing through a game or something, once you get kind of fluent at the system. So a two turn, two deck scenario is probably gonna be an hour and a half. A four deck is probably, you know, you're looking maybe two to three hours, probably a little bit, yeah, roughly in that range once you get fluent at it. To give you a rough idea on, on how long these can take to play out. Um, and I do wanna mention one thing. For the most part, I really like the way the time mechanic integrates with the deck play. There are some places at the end of a scenario where that running out of time 
can be a factor in that scenario where I feel like it can get a, it can get a little bit gamey. You can kind of like do a few things to speed up or slow down time that you might not necessarily do if the time wasn't connected to the deck. But I think with a couple of like house rules in there, like one of mine that I might put in is for example, uh, if a unit is designated to melee or something like that, that you always get a chance to resolve that melee before the scenario ends or something like that. But there's, it's, a mi it's a very minor thing, but I did notice that sometimes as I get close to the end of some scenarios where, okay, if I play in this two play, I could be really gamey right here and I could flush my deck in the scenario and win. So, which is a little bit, kind of feels a little bit awkward at times, but again, it's a very minor detail in a very complex system. Uh, and for the most part, again, I really like how the time works with the card deck and everything like that. It's a fun system and it kind of speeds up and slows down as the combat gets really intense, the cards get chewed up faster and you get a sense it's like the combat's rising to this crescendo. So it helps with kind of getting that kind of that dynamic narrative and feeling like the, the gritty nature of combat there too. So there's a ton of pluses, I think, with the card mechanic and the way it works in the game. Um, so I, I want to make sure I say those as well. And there we have it. This might be the longest review I've ever done of a game, but there's a ton, this is, I mean, there's a lot here both in the size and the scope of the game, the amount of stuff you get, the complexity of the systems, the nature of the gameplay once you get fluent at it. There's a ton to talk about. I could probably talk for another hour or so on different systems, on combat mechanics, on leadership, on morale, all these kinds of things. I mean, it's just a fascinating game to see kind of as you learn it and as you play it. Bottom line though, would I recommend this game? Yes, absolutely. This has been, this is definitely one of my top games of 2022. I have enjoyed, love playing this time with it. This is going to get to my table a lot. I really, really like this. And it's, I feel like it's fresh, it's unique. There's a ton of stuff going on. The amount of creativity that you can apply to the systems are just, it's just fantastic, incredible span of all kinds of awesomeness. That's probably not the most elegant way to say that, but yeah, it's, there's just a ton of awesomeness in the box. With that being said, you don't approach this like a casual date, right? This is a relationship, okay? So you, you wanna come into this game with both feet on the ground, seated at a table saying, I am gonna learn this game, and it might take me you know, four, five, six hours before I get fluent at the game, before I get up to speed at the game, and I'm gonna have to ask some questions, and I'm gonna have to do some rule book digging, and there might be some places where I can't find what I'm looking for, so I have to want it. But if you make that type of commitment, and you kind of say, yeah, I wanna learn this game, I think it's gonna reward you with fantastic gameplay experiences. And I think that's the biggest thing to say about it. You know, and if you're you know, happy to take a look, I, I'm gonna put a link to the unboxing here, and I'll put a link to the uh, the first episode of our gameplay. So if either of those things might help you kind of get more information about the game, I think with between the unboxing and the gameplay and the review, hopefully I've provided a, a good overview and a good picture of what I think about the game and, and how much I've enjoyed it. But yeah, fantastic experience. Thanks so much for watching everybody into our <laughs> mega long review. Have a great day, everybody. Bye. <laughs> Lastly, this is my dog, Kennedy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you want to say hi here? We're going to say hi? Okay. We're going to say hi. Dog appearance. <laughs>